Welcome to this service at St. Mark for the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. We are delighted to have you here worshiping with us. As we hear God's word, share in songs of praise and bring our prayers before God. As we worship together, united across the distance that keeps us safe. We give thanks for your continued support of the many ministries of our congregation and celebrate your generosity that makes it possible for us together to continue to share the love of Jesus in these difficult days. Please stay engaged with our life and ministry together by checking the Facebook page, our website and app, reading the weekly memos, for updates on important ministry happenings in the life of our congregation. Also be watching your mailbox for an important letter that was sent out this week. Next Sunday, August 30th at 9.30 a.m., we will have a service of Holy Communion in our parking lot, followed by a special congregational meeting to vote on Pastor Chad's call to be the next senior pastor of St. Mark. And there will be online accessibility for these services. Let us begin our worship with the order of confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope. For hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us pray. O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading this evening is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 51, beginning at verse, at verse 1. Listen to me, you that pursue righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, but I blessed him and made him many. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places and will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the voice of song. Listen to me, my people, and give heed to me, my nation, for a teaching will go out from me and my justice for a light to the peoples. I will bring near my deliverance swiftly. My salvation has gone out and my arms will rule the peoples. The coastlands wait for me and for my arm they hope. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath for the heavens will vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and those who live on it will die like gnats. But my salvation will be forever, and my deliverance will never be ended. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Second reading is from the book of Romans, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, Prophesy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, and the compassionate in cheerfulness. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. This is the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and re began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. 
But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm coming to you uh, this week not from a sanctuary that's recorded on a Wednesday evening, but from my own dining room. Uh, my family here is uh, under some, some strict quarantine rules as we await uh, some test results to make sure that we're all healthy and um, able to go about our lives and our business. Um, but until then, we remain at home. The location in today's gospel is, is very specific and it's not an accident, unlike the location that I seem to be in right now. Both Mark and Matthew uh, put this moment of Jesus' ministry, this, this turning point really, in, in, or, in or around the town of Caesarea Philippi. Near this uh, place, there was a cave with a spring in it that had a little creek that went out to uh, the River Jordan. And in this cave, there was a temple to the Roman god Pan. And there was... There were inscriptions in Greek, and you can still go there today and see not only um, tributes to, to this pagan god, but also to uh, other um, divine entities as well. Uh, Professor Audrey West um, also gives us some more historical background that's really important to understanding the location of today's gospel. She writes, a couple of decades before Jesus' birth, Herod the Great had built a temple near the spring in honor of Caesar Augustus. By the time Jesus and his disciples visited the region, Caesarea Philippi had been given over to the auspices of Herod's son, Philip the Tetrarch, who established the city as the administrative center of his government. By the time the Gospel of Matthew is written, people were likely aware that the Roman commander who had led the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70 had returned with his troops to Caesarea Philippi in celebration of their victory. So when Jesus is referred to as the Messiah, when, when Peter calls him the Messiah, Peter's doing more than simply making some theological statement. Jesus brings this question up in a, in a poignant location. Because you see, for Peter and for everyone else, the Messiah was one who was to come and establish God's reign through Israel forever. The one true God ruler of all. Instead of the reign of Roman authorities, their false gods and their destructive armies, the one true God would establish an everlasting kingdom through the Messiah. The city of Caesarea Philippi seems to be everything that the Messiah was to come and uproot. Peter knew that Jesus wasn't simply another prophet like Elijah or Jeremiah or John the Baptist. This was one who was sent by God to free Israel from all that had held it back. And Peter got it right. Well, halfway right, anyway. His moment of pride really lasts for only a moment. Peter's confidence, I'm sure, goes from one extreme to the other in the course of a paragraph, as Jesus both hails him and then rebukes him and calls him even Satan. You see, Peter knows Jesus is the Messiah. He's the first to even utter the word. Where he falters is not an in any sort of disbelief or malicious intent. He has simply never imagined that the Messiah might have bigger plans than the ones that humans had dreamed up. 
You see, to Peter and so many others in those days, the Messiah was going to bring that kind of narrow freedom that humans always seek through human means. Israel was under Roman occupation after all. And the only way they knew how to get out of it was by force. Through military might or divine power to push the occupying oppressors away, establishing and maintaining peace and freedom through violence and victory. They had every reason to think this is what the Messiah would do. This is how Joshua did it in the town of, around the town of Jericho. This is how David did it to, to secure and maintain the peace in Jerusalem in those early days of the kingdom. This is how Cyrus did it, the Persian, when he came to free the, the Israelites, the Judeans really, from, from exile in Babylon. These are all who, those who are called in the Old Testament, God's anointed. Messiahs with a little m, because that's what Messiah means, to be anointed. So the capital M Messiah, when he came, of course, would do things in the same manner, right? All the rulers and pagan gods celebrated in the city of Caesarea Philippi sought Peace in the exact same way as well for their own kind. Peter had never considered that God might do it another way. And he wasn't alone. In many ways, this is why so many folks soured on Jesus after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. In the course of a week, they discovered that he wasn't the resistance fighter that they had hoped for. Jesus, the Messiah, came to turn all these human expectations upside down. Those who want to lose their lives, or those who want to save their lives will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Jesus begins to instruct us that true freedom comes not through amassing more power than the threats of the world. True freedom comes when we acknowledge that no matter how big those threats might be, they can never have a shred of power over us. Jesus didn't fight and defeat death by fighting to avoid it. Death was defeated when Jesus went to the cross, died and rose again, and proved that nothing could keep him down, not even death itself because death never had any power over him to begin with. Jesus did so much more than establish an earthly sense of freedom, because earthly freedom is full of restrictions. It it can't be available to every person. It has to have borders to maintain peace. This is how governments have to work. Power and dignity are unevenly distributed. At any moment, the selfishness of some can disrupt the hopes of others. Divine freedom, on the other hand, doesn't push anyone away. It doesn't keep anyone out. It doesn't establish peace through force, but rather it seeks justice and mercy for every person who is bound by sin and fear and death. It can only be accomplished through God, by the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And nothing that anyone can do will diminish what God has done. This is true freedom. This kind of freedom is hard to wrap our heads around because it's so much different than any other kind of human idea of liberty. Jesus doesn't ask his disciples to be soldiers in a spiritual battle for peace. After Jesus tells Peter to set his mind on divine things, he says that any who want to be his followers must take up their cross and follow him. Not into battle, 
but to death and new life. What do you set your mind upon? How do you follow and live into the self-sacrificial freedom of Jesus? How do you deny yourself and pick up that cross? Is your faith rooted in restrictions? Or does your faith make you and those around you free? Think of it like this. When you, when you consider the hurt that is in the world, the bindings that are on other people that you may not have placed and most likely didn't, the weight that some carry and you do not through no fault of your own, when you think of these things, do you make excuses, explain it away, put the blame on someone else, say it's not your problem? Or does your faith cause you to look not on human things, but on divine things? The freedom that God has in store for each of us. That God wants all of us to have now in this life. Do you act in whatever way you can to loosen the burdens that are on God's children? You see, Jesus came to not fix the problems that God made but the problems that we humans made. And God loosens the bonds of suffering, of grief and injustice and grudges and heartache. All those ropes that hold us back from what God has created us to be. And as followers of Jesus, we can either acknowledge that Jesus, the Messiah, will do these things in his own self-sacrificial way, or we can be a stumbling block. We can try to stop what God is doing, or we can get out of the way and follow Jesus. Divine freedom is love without condition. It's compassion without self-protection. It takes the kind of imagination that Peter would eventually learn to have as he humbly followed his Messiah to the cross. Like all of us, Peter would have more missteps along the way. He wasn't perfect. But he followed Jesus, and when he messed up, he received God's grace nonetheless. He followed Jesus earnestly and hopefully, knowing that God would do amazing things that he could never possibly imagine, and trusting that whatever came, God would bring about true f freedom and peace for all of God's people. Peter saw this in the way that Jesus welcomed him after he denied Jesus three times, in the way that Jesus gave him a vision to welcome all people, not just his own kind, but all Gentiles everywhere, because what God has called unclean, you must not call profane. God opened up the imagination of Peter and all of us to see that God's freedom has no limits and no bounds. It has been loosed on heaven, and so we must loosen those binds here on earth along with God. May we all set our minds on God's divine grace and follow Jesus with awe and humility. Amen.
living together in trust and hope, let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident in your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here, at home, and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs, that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wondrous home you give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries, legislators and magistrates, mayors and councils to walk in your ways. Help leaders regard those in need with mercy 
and fulfill your loving purpose in the governance of peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill your purpose for us. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved, in trouble or adversity, or sick and in need of care. Especially Billy Reinhold, Jim Stewart, Carolyn Lee, Constance Carlson, Marilyn Vivian, Sherry Lindquist, Tim Vivian, Bill Jennings, Tim Pankovich, Betty Patterson, Jerry Kazaniga, David Young, Keith Hagestad, the family and friends of St. Mark people and those who serve in the military and health care and their families, and all we name in the silence of our hearts or out loud at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us into this community in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we were hewn, and you restore your people to the joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of our beloved dead. Bring us with them to our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen.
peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.